everybody, it's Sandy and welcome back to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health one topic at a time. It is post-op day six. Guys, here's my hand. <laughs> yeah, it's a big monstrosity. It's kind of a half cast. And then this is something that in retrospect, I wish I had not cut off. This is something that the surgeon attaches. It was this huge, long, like stocking gauze that could be used and fashioned into a sling so that I don't always have to get the external sling and like maneuver my whole arm into it and reposition it each time. This thing could have been pinned so that it was adjusted exactly for me. And you know, I could just slip it on and off over my head. So yeah, lesson number one, I'm gonna get into that in just a second, what I learned there. But yeah, so I had the CMC joint of the thumb. It's an called an arthroplasty and a tendon transfer. So, so that's the treatment for end-stage arthritis of the CMC joint, which is like where the thumb meets the wrist. We don't think of this right down here as the thumb, but in fact it is. And what they do is instead of using an artificial joint like they do with the knee or a hip, I think they can do that, but this is more common, they actually transfer part of a tendon. So it's part of you. It's not something that might get rejected. It's not something that's going to wear out. It's, it's a tendon. And it moves over and it forms like a soft ball almost for the thumb to kind of roll around and move in all the different directions it was able to before when that joint is all arthritic. So they shave out all the diseased part of the joint and then they put that tendon and they transfer it. Overall, the pain is kind of like I expected, okay? The very first day they did a block and they put, put the entire shoulder and the arm, everything completely to sleep. And this literally just rolls around. I mean, if you have to have it in the sling, if you let go, it'll like fall and smack down on something. You have no control from the shoulder down, ideally, if the block goes well. In my case, the block went very well. So everything was completely numb, and I was very much aware of how numb it was, and I was very grateful. I went home after surgery, and they said the block should wear off anywhere from 18 to 24 hours after it was put in. I think they put the block in around, oh, 11.30 in the morning, I'm guessing, and maybe it was like 11 o'clock, and I think it started to wear off around 10, and even then my pain wasn't bad. I was feeling tingling and stuff. I could move the hands, the fingers and stuff were still numb, but I could move them. And then I started to feel like a little bit of pain, and by the afternoon it was a real whopper. I wish that I had gone ahead and taken the pain relief as soon as I noticed that the block was beginning to wear off, because there's an overlap there. It starts to wear off kind of faster and faster, and there is a period of time it takes for the pain relief to start working. So my lesson number one in this is like, don't be a hero. Bone is very painful. So um, if I had it to do again, I would have taken the pain relief just right away as soon as I felt that tingling starting uh, in the fingers. That second day was pretty tough because not only did I not take the pain relief that soon, I decided I really wanted to get away without the narcotic. So I only took a second pain reliever that he gave me that was non-narcotic. And really on the very first day after surgery, that just isn't enough. And so I finally gave in several hours later. I, I just, I don't know why I insist on being a hero like that, but I really put up with a whole lot of pain before I finally went ahead and took that narcotic. So, you know, for the first couple of days, it was kind of like that. I mean, if you're not willing to take the pain relief, you're gonna be in a lot of pain. I did find that once I started doing that and I got on a little bit of a schedule, it was better. So on day three, I didn't take the narcotic during the day. I only took the other medication I was given and that's called Keterolac or Toradol. I did find that it actually helped almost probably better than the narcotic where the narcotic kind of has that aspect of it where you feel the pain, but you just kind of know it's there and you don't care as much. And it also kind of dummies down your senses and everything. It like dulls you down and makes you sleepy. The Toradol doesn't do all that. It's actually a profound anti-inflammatory. And I found that the Toradol really did actually address the bone pain a whole lot better. So anyway, day three went a whole lot better than day two. So you can imagine my surprise when day four was just awful. So I think that this area, like right about here, it feels like, you know, here, it feels like it's right about here uh, at the base of the thumb, which makes sense because that's where one of the incisions is. And I think that that area is just sitting up against this hard, it's wrapped in everything in something soft, but this is a hard structure and it's definitely wrapping everything very tight so that the wrist is immobilized. And I keep trying to like push at it on one side so it comes off of 
it on the other side so it's not like up against that incision. I think that just those nerves have been cut, they're smarting, and the skin is super sensitive and there's sutures there so it's probably not a perfectly smooth area and anything touching it is just really bothersome. I can't wait for those stitches to come out. I've got three more days before I go back to see the surgeon. Yeah, and so today's day six and I'd say that yesterday and today pretty much the same. Um, I have pain. It's not terrible. It's definitely been tolerable. Yesterday, I didn't really take anything during the day. Today, I decided to go ahead and take one of the Toradols during the day, and it does help a lot. It's When I do have bouts of pain, I kind of remind myself that they come and go. It seems like I've seen a pattern now where it bothers me for a while, and then after a few minutes, it kind of stops smarting, and then I can forget about it for a little while again. Uh, it definitely helps to keep it elevated. I don't have my sling on right now, but I definitely try to keep it up above my heart. I don't have to do that anymore. They said the first four days were most important. My fingers are just the tiniest bit puffy. They're really not, I wouldn't even call them swollen. Um, the thumb I'm moving, they told me to make sure to move the tip of the thumb. It's interesting because I can't really move the tip of the thumb without feeling like I'm doing some work down here. I just have to trust that the cast is made in such a way that even if I feel some work going on down here, it's prohibiting the kind of movement that would be detrimental to this because I'm really moving the tip like they told me to. They said the fingers to make sure not to wiggle, but to actually move through the entire range of motion. I'm doing that really well now. Um, day one and day two, it was just excruciating to make myself do this, but I did make myself do it all the time. I was just constantly doing it, and I think that really helped to keep the swelling down, then along with keeping it elevated above the level of my heart. I'm going to tell you what I did wrong with this sling. So my surgeon told me a couple of days before surgery that he was going to have this thing here and it was going to be a long tubular gauze that was connected underneath the dressings that I could just use to form a sling by bringing it under my elbow and pinning it a certain way. And here's the problem. I did a video not too long ago about what's changed in surgery since COVID. And one of the things that's changed is you no longer have somebody go in with you. You get dropped off. You're there for the whole experience on your own. And then they come and pick you up outside. They pull up, like in this case, it was a circular drive. My husband pulled up. Anybody who communicated with him did so over the phone. So there was no other person there being like the eyes and ears. So what I'm going to recommend to people is if you're having any kind of surgery anytime soon, anything where you're going to be sedated at all, any conversation you've had with your surgeon, make sure to go over it in detail with somebody that you love so that somebody who's not going to be sedated that day, even if they're not there, knows the lowdown and knows what to do. Because here's what happened. My surgeon explained this thing to me. And when I was all sedated, waking up, and I was kind of like, I, I mean, I barely even remember this experience. The nurse noticed I was waking up. And then their job is, to, of course, to get you out of there as fast as possible. And she starts helping me get dressed. And here's this big thing. And I'm kind of like saying, oh, I don't remember what I said. Something like, it. the doctor told me this is a sling or something. And, and she basically just said, yeah, just cut this thing off. We're going to give you a sling. We just, we don't really use this thing. We just cut it off. And I thought, okay, and so we got home and I told my husband to cut this thing off. And, you know, a few hours later, I started to sort of come to my senses and I remembered, oh yeah, <laughs> there was a purpose for this. So I know that the real problem here is that the nurse and the surgeon told me two different things. And what I learned later in the post-op phone call is that they don't use this right after surgery because it's not a sturdy enough sling to support the arm if it is blocked. So given the fact that my whole arm was blocked, it would have just fallen out of this thing. And that's why it's important to use a more secure sling that they give you. It's a little more bit of a little more work to get into. But after the block wears off, this would have been really convenient. So I've only got a few more days in this thing. I did speak with the nurse who called me the next day after surgery and I talked with her about this and she said, I'm just gonna have to get that clarified, I'm sorry. I mean, it was already cut off, there's nothing to do about it now, but I kind of wish I had sort of gone over that, anything that I was gonna have to know for that day. I just wish I had really gone over that, talked to my husband about it so maybe he could follow up when they made a phone call to him. I don't know if it would have changed a thing, uh, but I, I doubt I would have gotten him to cut it off if he had sort of been prepared that we were supposed to use it somehow. So yeah, to that extent, it would have helped. So yeah, it's just one of these things in the days of COVID, you're, 
you know, if you're sedated, you're not the one who's going to be saying, wait a minute, stop. I'm not getting in that wheelchair until you go get somebody and let's clarify because I'm getting two different messages here. And I was just too sedated for that. So whatever, that was the only issue. And if that's my only issue, I've done really well. I hope I get as good an outcome as I think I can expect. My block was fantastic. My anesthesia team was fantastic. I had a nice thing happen right off the bat when we got there for the day. I had actually asked after we checked into the desk if we could wait outside because interestingly enough, I asked the nurse who was checking everybody in, I guess the receptionist, I said, what percentage of people are vaccinated versus do the PCR test like three days before surgery? And she said, it's about 50-50. God, I actually wish I hadn't asked. So whatever, we asked if we could go wait outside until we were called. And when somebody came to get me, to get me into the pre-op room and get me admitted, the nurse happened to be somebody that I knew and I had worked with for years, like 10 years at a previous facility. I didn't know she was working at this particular place. So it was just a really welcome surprise to see somebody not only somebody I knew, but somebody whose work I knew was good work. It looked to me like pre-op was kind of in an L-shaped section along the two walls of the room, I think. And she said, I've kind of got you in a little place all by yourself. So I was sort of way off in a corner somewhere. And there, the whole time, like nobody was admitted either on either side of me. I was just really alone over there with curtains around me and things. And she also just said, you know, I just happen to know that the people who had surgery in your room today before you, there have been two cases in there before you, and both of those patients have been vaccinated, which was really nice. Now, she didn't divulge anything that's confidential. There's nothing wrong with saying that, but I just felt like she probably wouldn't have gone out of her way to think of that even, you know, had we just not had a certain comfort level there. So it, that was very reassuring to hear. And then I had a really nice anesthesia team, and like I said, they did that block, and I don't even remember it. I was, like, so sleepy, but um, both my anesthesiologist, my nurse anesthetist were both really nice, took very good care of me, and I just felt like I, I felt like I was in really good hands the whole time. In case anybody's going to ask, I wore my Sonovia Pro to the surgery center. I did keep it on uh, until, you know, I went back for surgery. Issue number two I'm going to talk about because I'm just wondering if, especially from nurses, if I'm going to get some comments in the comments section about Keterolac, which is Toradol. So Toradol is a really interesting drug, and it seems like it's a little bit controversial. So it is a profound anti-inflammatory, so you'd put it in the category of like Advil, Ibuprofen, Aleve, things like that. But it is a prescription only, and they say only to take it for like five, six days. I suppose that means if you're taking it around the clock, which I never have once. I've only ever taken one of those within a 24-hour period, so my guess is I could go on taking it longer, although I won't. And it seems that surgeons fall into two different camps. Some like the fact that Toradol does offer a whole lot of relief from bone pain in particular. And some studies show that Keterolac relieves bone pain better than does narcotic. And for that reason, I can remember back when I was doing a lot of orthopedic anesthesia, that Keterolac was pretty new back then. And I, we were giving it in the intravenous. I don't even think there was a by mouth preparation. I think it was only intravenous at first, if I remember correctly. And I always gave patients Toradol before they woke up because it just had such profound relief from bone pain. And bone pain is like a whole different kind of pain all in, a, in and of itself. It's, it's very hard to take. So I really like Keterolac for that. But of course, it wasn't long before that we start to get research telling us about the trade-offs, just like with everything else. And it does seem that with some of these anti-inflammatories, they do retard healing a little bit. They slow the healing. So inflammation is part of healing. So if you're going to be too anti-inflammatory, you're actually a little bit anti-healing, right? You're going to be slowing all the inflammatory process down, which is the early part of healing. So I struggled with that a bit. On the one hand, I was really happy to see when my surgeon handed me the scripts I was going to need and go get filled before surgery. I saw that one of them was Keterolac and I thought, oh, wow, I'm so glad you're using this because I just anticipated this being so painful. And he said, yeah, it's just really terrific, very effective pain relief. And on the other hand, I thought to myself, well, what about all these surgeons that say they don't use it because it will slow the healing down? So I decided I was just going to have you know, like I say on this channel a lot, a nuanced view, which I think is like the only mature view to have for a lot of these things. I just feel like these all or none kind of approaches just generally don't work. So, you know, I haven't taken toward all around the clock. I haven't needed to, frankly. 
Uh, the first few nights when it came to nighttime relief, I took the narcotic plus the visceral. Visceral is to avoid any kind of nausea from the narcotic, but it also potentiates the narcotic. And I knew that it makes you sleepy. I know this just from my clinical work. So I took the two together at night. Enough said, I, I don't know if I felt pain at all through the night, but I sure don't remember. So that's all I did through the night. There was really no reason to take the tour at all. And for, I guess, four out of the six post-op days, I have taken the Keterlac, the Toradol, uh, once just during the day, uh, the four out of six days post-op. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that I think this is the way to go. And here's why. Do I have any doubt that theoretically or in real time that taking the anti-inflammatory can slow the healing? I don't doubt that. I'm sure that it can. I'm sure that it does. But at the same time, you know, I think that writhing in pain and all the stress hormones that get circulating when you're in terrible pain and not being able to sleep and all the other pain it causes you because you're clenching this and trying to hold this and now my shoulder hurts and my elbow hurt. And by the way, don't get me started on my elbow. It's all bruised up. Lots of different things start hurting. And, you know, I noticed that on day three, which is the first day I took the Toradol um, during the day only, well, a co about an hour and a half later, it settled down and I could sleep. And I napped pretty much on and off the whole rest of the day and still slept the whole night. And I think that's really conducive to healing. So, yeah, that's my view when it comes to Toradol. Anybody else having surgery out there, you're going to have to have the discussion with your own surgeon. I wouldn't base my whole opinion of a surgeon on this. Like if I thought I'd found the right surgeon the best surgeon who was going to give me the best opportunity to have a good outcome all the way around, and he didn't want to prescribe, he or she just didn't prescribe Toradol, I wouldn't sweat it. I would just get through it. But as long as mine does, I think that for me, this was really in the plus column, and I'm going with the nuanced perspective. Now, I think that some of this is just very generalizable to bone pain in general, but I will say that anybody has not only this thumb joint surgery, but any hand, wrist, elbow, whatever. When you're dealing with your arm, you're holding up the arm, you know, the shoulder starts to hurt, the elbow starts to hurt. There's there's all kinds of things there. And if you can just get a little bit of that anti-inflammatory and you can like start getting yourself to move other things around and then move the fingers without clenching them, stop from clenching your jaws or your, realize how much you're clenching your brow and whatnot. I think all that stuff is really helpful. And I think just having that toward all really helped me do that. Finally, I want to leave you with a trick that I've learned that's really helpful. If you've got any kind of hand surgery, wrist, whatever, you've got a cast. One of the things that I found is tremendously helpful is I'm not using it for its intended purpose. This is one of those like silicone rubbery discs to open jars with. Now, yeah, I found these helpful when I was able to open jars at all. But this is really helpful to like lay down on the table or on the countertop and put a bowl on top of it. If you're like eating a bowl of yogurt because your hand is so weak that even though it looks like I could like pretty much use this to hold something still, I really can't. Just about anything that touches these fingers, that, that's about all the pressure they can take. I'm really not supposed to do anything with this hand. So I can't be using it to even steady something. So I found that putting something on for some traction, like on the countertop and then putting like a bowl of yogurt on there and eating from there and the bowl wasn't sliding around on me. So this is my first tip trick for anybody who's got one hand immobilized, at least in the early stage when you're in the cast. All right, so I'm going to follow up after I see the surgeon. Today is day six. I'm seeing him on day nine. I'm supposed to get this thing off. I think ideally stitches out. And he fashions a cast that I believe is gonna stay on for another three and a half weeks after that. Ugh. And yeah, we'll see. So until next time, be well. Bye-bye.